Uh, hello, brothers and sisters. I'm really happy to see you, see all of those of you who have come uh, to this lecture, They're representing uh, a discussion, a continuing discussion uh, of the uh, Department of Africology as well as the Maleficati Asante Institute uh, in terms of uh, African history and culture and an understanding and an appreciation of the tremendous achievements that have been done in the name of Africa. Uh, my discussion to you, uh, with you today, is on African civilizations. And I won't be very long on this. I do just want to make a uh, comment, a comment that I've been making recently, and that is in regards to uh, the question of uh, African people uh, being engaged in the political process. Uh, I think it is essential, uh, at least in my case and in my family, in my own opinion, uh, when we are uh, confronted with a situation about uh, the political will of the people, that we express our political will. Uh, I am a descendant of people who lived in the small towns of Georgia and who could not vote because uh, it was, uh, they, they were threatened with the end of their lives. They would be murdered, killed if they went to the polls. And for so many years, until 1965, uh, even in my family, uh, my people did not vote. But those of us who were younger, demonstrated, marched. I marched with the Diane Nash in Nashville, Tennessee. Others marched with William Barbie and other people who uh, really devoted their lives to the right for African people to vote in this country. And I am also uh, related to the family of Mary Turner, who was murdered, uh, lynched uh, in Valdosta, Georgia, having her pregnant womb split open and the fetus uh, stomped to death by white vigilantes. I know the role in a political uh, body uh, that voting uh, uh, creates. I know the role it creates for us. It creates an entry. And one of the reasons whites have not often wanted blacks in the South to vote is because they feared that the vision, the political vision, the will, the moral vision, and the ethical vision of black people would be for justice. And that is the, the great, great fear of, of the white population, that a majority of black people voting would be voting always on the side of what is progressive, what is right, what is moral, what is ethical. So I just want to say in this season of political discourse that we understand that African civilization, the very first civilizations that we know of are on the African continent, but those civilizations were civilizations that reach for the highest vision of humanity. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, several classical civilizations. I'm not going to talk about them uh, all uh, with the uh, same degree of depth, but I will refer you to uh, my book, uh, The History of Af Africa. The History of Africa is the uh, uh, most uh, comprehensive book uh, dealing with the entire continent of Africa uh, by an African uh, writer, an African scholar. And it is now in its third edition I'm in, uh, I'm looking uh, forward to the fourth edition, which will be even larger. And the reason for that is because as every day I live, I discover something new about this uh, incredibly uh, productive continent. Uh, not only was it prolific, but because the origin of humanity is on the continent of Africa, and because the origin of the first nation is on the continent of Africa, uh, the continent of Africa has given us uh, a civilization that really undergirds most of the civilizations of the world. And that is a good thing. 
it's a good thing because the original foundations were were developed by the concept of ma'at. And ma'at, ma'at uh, reaches back uh, to the notion that uh, when the divinity created the universe, the only element uh, with the divinity was ma'at. And so ma'at is extremely important in terms of balance and harmony and order and justice. These were fundamental to the African way of looking at things. So uh, the first uh, thing I want to say also, in addition to preparing for this conversation, is that uh, I'm using the term civilization probably more than I'm using civilizations. And the reason I'm using civilization is the same reason that I've always used religion, African religion, instead of African religions. Uh, because uh, I see unity, a fundamental unity, in the uh, concepts that are that drive what we consider to be uh, African uh, civilization. So whether we talk about Kemet, uh, which uh, uh, has been called uh, Egypt since the coming of the Greeks, or Nubia, or Aksum, or Ghana, or Borno or um, Mali, or Shanghai, Zimbabwe, Manomatapa, uh, Congo, uh, Yoruba, Akan, whatever civilization of African people we can name, the uh, commonality, uh, commonalities uh, seem to be uh, uh, reaching to all of them. In fact, th there is no civilization that I know, for example, in Africa, where uh, the notion of harmony and balance uh, is, is not known. I mean, there is this sense that what we work for when we work as human beings and when we live as human beings, when we exist as family, that we look for what is harmonious, what is just, what is righteousness, this is the African way. If we don't have justice, if we don't have harmony, if we don't have balance, then we have nothing. This, this is what we work for. So when there's, there, there are disputes, whether those disputes are over physical things like land, or whether those are disputes that are ideological, the, the question that we have are questions about how do we restore consensus, a sense of balance and harmony, and reciprocity uh, to humanity, you see? So uh, that, that, that is a basis. But uh, there's another basic concept, which is also, which I put, I put it right alongside uh, harmony and balance, and that is respect for the elders and ancestors. Because the way African civilization worked was that, uh, we were able to rely upon the wisdom of those who had experienced things before we experienced them. It's not that they were always uh, factually right. Later on, we discovered, oh, you know what? Uh, you know, ancestors so-and-so thought such and such, but now this is what we think. Uh, th that happens in every society. It, it happens in every civilization. No civilization comes and says, you know, this is the way it is forever. But what this gave us as African people was a respect for tradition. And what tradition does, it creates the platform for innovation. If you don't have tradition, you have no basis upon which to have uh, any innovation. Th this is why with the, uh, even if you look at what the Western civilization did, they, they used the Greek civilization as a foundation. And from that, they created what they call Neo-Greek or Neo-Classical. And what Neo means is new. It's like we looked at the Greeks and then this is what we built. Well, this is, we were the first ones to do that. We, we were the ones who laid the foundation for elders and ancestors. And then after we laid those foundations for elders and ancestors, then we were able to look at other societies throughout the continent of Africa and to say, okay, 
we, we have this and therefore these things can occur and this can be the way this is and so forth. Patterns of life, uh, some people call them myths, mythical ideas that arrange for us a particular way to view reality that was not just rhythmic, but rhythmic with harmony and balance and order. The, the other one is love of children. This is common in African culture. It's not a, a love of children uh, uh, simply uh, uh, in the sense that uh, we, we people talk about it in the West, but it's the idea that uh, if you uh, honor your elders and your ancestors, your children will honor you, that your name will be praised, that you, if you ritualize your ancestors, uh, you pour libation to them when you get ready to make a great decision, um, when you get ready to have a meeting, uh, your children will pour libations to you. And that means that they will remember the things you taught and what you gave them. And so we pass this down from generation to generation. The love of children and, and the fact that uh, women and men who have children and and uh, glory in their children and love their children are considered the richest people uh, in the African culture. And then loyalty uh, to community. Uh, this is a, a basic thing too. All these are basic ideas in terms of commonalities. I mean, you can't find an African civilization or, or African culture where this is not the case, where you cannot have uh, fundamentally uh, where you cannot have fundamentally uh, this idea that we as African people are uh, not, um, uh, we, we are African people uh, are, are not loyal to each other and to community. Because what happens if we are not loyal, then what happens, you put out of the community, you put outside of the circle, you put outside of the circle, uh, because you have been shamed. And there is no concept of guilt in African civilization. People don't go around having sense of guilt. Uh, that's not a traditional African concept. It's a Western concept, perhaps even an Arab concept, but it, an Islamic concept, but it doesn't come, or a Christian concept, but it doesn't come from an African place. Africa, we, we have always believed in shame. Shame was when you committed something that was against the community, when you uh, broke a, a, a taboo or protocol, which would bring harm on the community, then you had to leave the community. That's because of shame. It's a collective, it's a collective element, not an individualistic element like guilt, you see? So that was the key to our understanding, our our history, I mean, throughout Africa also is the burial of the dead. In every society, every civilization that we can think of in terms of the African world, there, there was never a, a preponderance of uh, cremation. It didn't mean that people were not cremated. Uh, I'm, I, th th there can be some examples of that. It, it, it doesn't mean that the, 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 the uh, ashes or uh, bones of ancestors were not uh, kept somewhere in some places at some times. But fundamentally, Africans believed in the regeneration and the reincarnation of uh, humans. It's not like the uh, Indians, the Hindu, who believed in you reincarnated into an animal. Uh, like a cat or a dog or something, but but in, uh, reincarnated in the sense of our grand, great, great grandchildren, that this is a spirit we have seen before. And we often say things like that. Wow, oh boy, this spirit, this child, this newborn baby, this child has a the spirit of her great great grandmother, you know, someone who remembers the great great grandmother would say that, you see. So uh, th this is a commonality. Another commonality is what I call character being the highest value, not love, as in the Christian concept, they say, well, love is the highest virtue. 
Uh, the, the highest virtue for African uh, civilization is what the Yoruba people call Iwa. And they, they say Iwa Pele, which means good character. Good character, because the only thing that the divinity asks of us is good character. Even if we are uh, um, uh, wealthy or educated, that means nothing unless we have good character. This is why we have a distinction between African civilization and Western civilization. It is not a civilization where the aggrandizement for oneself in terms of the making of money is the most significant aspect or where this notion of love, which is in many ways a confusing notion in terms of what it means, even in the Western society, is significant. But what is significant for us is character. Because character will give you the things that you think love gives you. Because character will give you the things that almost any other value of virtue or gives you, character gives it to you. So character is essential. Uh, there are many others. I mean, if anybody's truly interested in this, you certainly have an opportunity to read uh, this in my book, uh, The African Pyramids of Knowledge. The African Pyramids of Knowledge. It, there's a whole section on the common values of, between, of African societies and cultures in that particular book. So now back to the particular uh, civilization that I wanted to share with you. I wanted to uh, share with you uh, the uh, civilization of Kemet because sometimes people don't realize that th the first nation in the world in the sense you had uh, uh, before uh, Kemet, you had kingdoms, you, you had uh, uh, queendoms, you had places where you had one monarchical leader, uh, 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 one uh, uh, monarch, I'm sorry, one mo monarch who, who led uh, a, a group of people. And these kingships were sometimes very large, very huge, major kingship. But, uh, uh, but what happened when Menes, uh, the black king of uh, southern Egypt, decided to conquer uh, all of the other uh, ethnic communities along the Nile River. Uh, he conquered 42 different groups. And these uh, Sepats, as they were called, Sepats, S-E-P-A-T-S, Sepats, uh, which were then re renamed by the Greeks, Gnomes. These Sepats, uh, each one had its own king. And they also, not only that, had their own uh, notion of uh, the divinity and what was divine and they, they had their own language uh, uh, and, and so forth. So what Menes was able to do was to bring them together under one polity, one governing structure. And this created the first nation in the world. And this may have been around 3400 BC. This is what we say approximately 3400 BC, E, before the Christian era. But this, but remember, this is not the earliest African civilization. This is the earliest African uh, nation. Uh, Africans, uh, uh, in terms of civilization, uh, we know that there were communities as old as 100,000 years in Africa. And these 100,000 year uh, communities uh, were mostly in Southern Africa where we find uh, the incredible ruins uh, in the uh, province of Mpumalanga uh, of um, uh, Nzalo uh, Ilanga. This, this is like 100,000 years ago. I went there to see it with my own eyes. I traveled with my colleague. Uh, young brother, uh, Simpiwe Sisanti. And we went there, we, we drove out of uh, Mpumalanga up into the mountains and the hills, and we saw these incredible uh, stele that had been placed there by our ancestors long before the dawn of civilization anywhere else in the earth. 
and they created monumental uh, structures that uh, actually dot the, which actually dot the entire region of um, of, uh, of Southern Africa. So, uh, so these these were the earliest ones, and then of course th th there are others older than Kemet. Sometimes we start with Kemet, and people think that well, Kemet must be uh, the early oldest civilization. No, no, Kemet Kemet is the oldest nation, the oldest nation where you have more than one uh, ethnic group, uh, one cultural group, one political unit uh, coming together, where you have a multiplicity of peoples you see in cultures. And uh, it, it is brought together under the control of uh, a particular governing structure. Uh, th but the first um, physician, first philosopher to that, uh, to Kemet was Imhotep. And Imhotep, doesn't live at the same time as many. Many lived uh, three or four hundred years before uh, it, we get to Imhotep. And um, you know, it's almost like saying some people lived uh, uh, during the time of Thomas Jefferson in the United States of America, and some people live during the time of John Kennedy. Well, John Kennedy and Thomas Jefferson are not in the same era, you see. And, and so, so many live much long, much before uh, Imhotep, but yet Imhotep, uh, living around 28 or uh, 2700 BC, is the first physician that we have any record of. He's the first philosopher we have any record of, and he's the first builder of a pyramid that we have that we know about. So people say, oh, there are pyramids in this place and that place. No, 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 no. The first pyramid was built by a black man. His name was Imhotep. And, and Imhotep was uh, the beginning of the diagnosis for diseases. He was a poet. He was one who studied everything. He is the great example of the educated human. This is the first time you see anyone, you can't name anybody else earlier than M. Hotel, who was a great student of the universe. This is before Buddha. This is before Muhammad. This is before Jesus. This is before Confucius. This is, this is early. This is 27, 2800 BC, M. Hotel. This is a name that should be known by every child who goes to school anywhere on the earth. The first queen was given to us by Kemet. Merneith, 3,000 before the Christian era. There's a woman whose husband, who was para, you know, para is the African word. This is the ancient word for Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the Jewish word, the Hebrew word for the king, the, the the, the, the major leader, not Kim, major leader of Kemet, the Pura, meaning the great house. The, the great house, Jet, died. And when Jet died, in order to keep the dynasty going, her, uh, his uh, wife, Mernith, became the first queen in the history of the world written down, you know, in terms of where we know this is true. This is the first woman who takes over. The, the, given 100,000 years ago, when we talk about 100,000 year civilization, when we talk about the civilization of Enzalo Ilanga, uh, there, there had to be other women who, who led. But this is the first one we know historically. The second one we know historically was Sobek Neferu. So Bek Neferu was, she was a, a leader, the Parat, you put the T on for feminine, and uh, you say Para for the uh, male uh, leader, and uh, Parat for So Bek Neferu. And uh, So Bek Neferu uh, lived around 1985 years before Jesus Christ. She was the second uh, woman that we know of historically that ruled during the 12th, you see, ruled during the 12th uh, dynasty, the 12th big family of, of, of royal royal leaders. And then Hatshepsut, who ruled in the 18th dynasty. 
She ruled, uh, she was living around 1550 BCE, before the Christian era. And Hatshepsut, probably the greatest queen of ancient Kemet. And then later on, of course, we know that there were some other minor ones. And then there was finally Cleopatra, the last one, uh, who uh, spent much of her life chasing uh, the Caesars. But uh, uh, that was around 30 BC. Okay, so then now let's move to, we, so we talk about Kemet. Let, let me just talk quickly about um, Nubia. And the reason I want to talk about Nubia is because it is in Nubia. And I, I, there's so much more to say about Kemet. I mean, one could do an entire uh, year on just every aspect of Kemet. And uh, I, again, I refer you to the history of Africa for information about that. Uh, because in, in my book, The History of Africa, I have written a lot of detail, much more detail, about all these civilizations, about all these uh, cultures. Um, Nubia. In Nubia, we have three major um, uh, uh, areas of influence and power, Meroe, Kush, and Napata. And let me just say about Nubia, because people get this confused. The Nubians are a riverine people. That means they live alongside the river, just like the Kemetic people do. If you go away from the river, in, in the Nile River, which flows 4,200 miles in the African continent, uh, all the way from Uganda, Rwanda, all the way down to the Mediterranean, actually f flowing uh, north, uh, 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 northward, uh, which is the down direction, in that part of the world. Um, it, what you see is that uh, civilization is along the river for the most part, those great civilizations. Uh, because if you get further out, you get into the desert on both sides of the river. And uh, the Nubians, if you take today what's happened in Sudan, the Sudanese government has moved people, many of the Nubian people away from their original homes into the desert. And they've sort of made the Nubians desert people, when in fact, the Nubians are riverine people, some of the first, even earlier than in Kemet. Uh, you had these civilizations growing up. But the great cities of Meroe and Kush and Napata, these are names that our children should know. Because Meroe and Kush and Napata were some of the most glorious cities in the, in, in the ancient world. And when you start talking about the ancient world, you have to, you, Africa is right there. You, people sometimes talk about Greeks as being old, but you can only start with 800 BC with Greek civilization. And that's when you get Homer. And the first voice that we understand out of the Greeks is Homer's voice. And then Homer tells us, when you start reading Homer, that he uh, had a lot of relationships with Africa, that basically uh, even the, uh, the, the, the gods, they, they came out of there, that the, 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 the most handsome people were from Africa, and uh, that the gathering of the divinities was in Africa and so forth. So, so, so Nubia is an important uh, place. Uh, for us. And it is now, um, in, if you look at the modern map, it is southern Egypt and uh, the first, top third of the country that we now call Sudan. That, that's what, what was ancient Nubia. And a lot of it is underwater, actually, because when they built the uh, Egyptian high dam uh, and created Lake Nasser in the 19, uh, late 1960s, they actually flooded uh, two to four hundred villages and shrines and temples of the ancient uh, uh, Nubian people. So, so our civilization is actually underwater, uh, just like our, uh, our bones, the bones of our ancestors often are under the water uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. They're under the water in Lake Nasser. So it's older than uh, Kemet, Nubi is in terms of the monarchy, had more, more women rulers, 42 rulers, Candaces, they sometimes are called, are Kandakas. These Kandakas or Candaces built pyramids. They have pyramids to them. The women, women leaders have their own pyramids. They, this is a great civilization. 
older than Kemet in terms of the monarchy because we know this from what is called the Custo, Q-U-S-T-U-L. You can look it up, the Custo incense burner with an image of a facade of a palace on it long before Kemet was ever, ever developed, long before Menes, you see? And it influenced Kemet spiritually. And in fact, one of the great temples to the deity, Amen, is called uh, Jebel Barkal today, but it was the temple uh, that was the largest temple probably built at that time. Jebel Barkal, they called it now. It's ruins now, of course. And the major Kandakis, uh, Kandases, uh, uh, queens, uh, were people like Amanarenus, who, who was, we know about her because they wrote about her, the Romans wrote about her. She's blind in one eye, but one of the bravest uh, people uh, that uh, uh, Gaius Petronius, the Roman had ever met. She fought him, fought him to a, to a standstill. Amanarenus, great, great warrior, Nubian queen. <clears throat> Amana Shakani defeated Caesar Augustus. And then her daughter, Amana Tori, protected Cush from all outside enemies. Jesus is three. And the name Amani is the same word we get from Imani. And Imani, Amani, they all come from Amen, having to do with faith with deep spirituality. But Amanorinus lives around 40 BCE and, and, and fought Gaius Petronius in 27 BCE. Amana Shaketi lived around 10 BCE and defeated Augustus, stopping Augustus from taking over Nubia keeping him, forcing his forces to stay, his armies to stay in Egypt, in Kemet. And Amanatori in 50 AD is still the great uh, Kandesi, a Parat, who is protecting Kush. There, there, there are 42 women rule in Nubia. You, you think about that in terms of human history where you have 42 women ruling. That, there's no other civilization in antiquity where that is the case. You, you didn't have that case, for example, when you start talking about the rulers of, um, um, you know, you don't have that when we start talking about the rule, rulers of uh, Greece. How many women leaders can you name from the ancient Greeks? What about from the ancient Romans? What about from the ancient Chinese? the ancient uh, Hindu Indians, who, who can you name? But 42 women, this, I, I'm just trying to Im impress upon you the incredible significance of Africans laying the very uh, uh, ground for us to even have a conversation about what is correct in the world. I mean, if we look back, of course, we know that throughout this Nile Valley, whether we're talking about Nubia or whether we're talking about Kemet, we have the greatest conquering kings right up and down that Nile Valley. People like Sinosert III, who is the 12th dynasty king of Kemet, considered one of the three greatest conquerors who ever lived. Thutmose is the third, 18th dynasty, who in my judgment, I've written about and I've said he was the greatest conqueror that the world has ever known. And there's a reason why I'm saying that. I'm not just saying it because he's an African. I'm saying it because when I compare him with other people that they consider to be great King, uh, conquerors, um, if one uses that notion as a way to 
you know, it's a dubious notion in terms of how you talk about civilization. But, um, but Genghis Khan, um, Kublai Khan, Alexander, um, Napoleon, no, none of these leaders compare any way to Tutmosis III. T Tutmosis III is even great in the context of the other great kings of the Nile Valley, like uh, Ramses II, the 19th dynasty king, uh, who saw Thutmosis III as his model, or Taharqa, the 25th dynasty king, who saw Ramses II as his model. So, so you get Senarset III, whose army went all the way over to what is today Georgia, near the Black Sea. Tutmosis III, who led 17 battle campaigns against the enemies of Kemet. The, the 17 battle campaigns where uh, uh, a, a, a king goes out in front of the army and leads that army 17 times into battle against different enemies. That has never happened in the world. In fact, Europeans call Alexander the Greek the, the greatest, and he led seven campaigns against enemies of Macedonians and was defeated in his final campaign. But Thutmosis III, going in 17 battle campaigns at the head of his army, no greater conqueror do we know of. And he went uh, not just right around in Nubia, fighting the Nubians, who were the same basic people, African people. Sometimes people want to make a distinction. Well, he fought the Nubians. They must have been a different race. Why? The French, uh, the Germans fought the French. Well, why would that, why would the, the Germans and the French same basic people, European people? No, it doesn't. It means that they were close. You, you, there are contests and competitions between enemies. You see, and uh, but but Ramses II, who fought the Syrians, the Hittites, but he also fought the Libyans and the Nubians, who were very close. But the Libyans and the Nubians were were black people. You see, his greatest battle, Ramses II's greatest battle, was Kadesh battle first battle that was recorded in history. If you start like, when is the first time that a battle was recorded in history, written down by historians? It was the African battle with the, with the Syrians, or the Hittites, rather. And then what was, the, what was the first peace treaty? First peace treaty was in 1279, before the Christian era. That also was with an African country, Kemet and the Hittites. And then look at this Taharqa, the great King Taharqa, whose, uh, whose conquering uh, achievements are tremendous. And when you go to Kemet, as I've been many times, and you walk along the uh, monuments of Karnak Temple, and you see the huge statue of Taharqa, you see his achievements. You, you, you have to see them in the light of Ramses because, of course, Ramses was an uh, example to him as an ancestor. But, but he also was great. He even took the army of, uh, uh, of uh, Egypt all the way over to what is now Spain. Th that is how great his army was and how great he was as a conqueror. So we have to think of African discoveries. I mean, whether we're talking about the 8,000-year-old canoe that they discovered in, in Nigeria, uh, the 10,000 miles of uh, tunnels underground in Ghana and Nigeria, particularly the Eredo Trench in Nigeria, which is one of the largest human-made um, uh, projects in the world, uh, 100 miles around uh, the uh, ancient uh, kingdoms in Nigeria, the gold kingdom of Mapungubwe in South Africa, uh, 
the largest stone tomb in central is, is found in the Central African Republic. And, and these civilizations, I mean, Ghana, starting rising around 300 BCE, this incredible civilization, uh, Mali, the great civilization led by Sundiata, the most famous name at one time in West Africa, Sundiata. My good friend Jabril Niani wrote the uh, translation of the great epic of Sundiata, of an old Mali. This is, this is an epic of old Mali, Sundiata, by Jabril Niani, N-I-A-N-E, one of the great giants of African history and literature. But what did the ancient world learn from Africa? They learned law, they learned philosophy, they learned medicine, they learned sculpture, they learned mathematics, they learned geometry, they learned astronomy. And I can go on and tell you not only that, but they, they, even the calendar we use today, where did that calendar come from? Is based on the calendar of the African people. But we have been a dispossessed people through invasions, conquests, colonialism, enslavement. And then our history was often written by those who were conquerors and those who dispossessed us. Not only did they do that, but they gave us their own religion, you see. So when I think about Africa and I think about the attacks on the African people, it, 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 it says to me that one of the things that we have got to do is we have got to go back to our own history and culture. We've got to understand how important a place, for example, like uh, the Great Zimbabwe is. I've been there three times. And every time I go to the Great Zimbabwe, I'm always amazed at the Great Zimbabwe because here is where our ancestors built a civilization and put these granite stone blocks together without cement and created in the, in, in the most natural way one of the great cities, stone cities in the world. If you go to Zimbabwe, you come back and you say, wow, there's nothing like it. I mean, even when you start trying to understand and study the very nature of the curvature of that architecture, it, it, it baffles you. It, it's not 90 degree angle architecture, and yet it's a great structure. And if you understood the context of that whole monomotapa uh, civilization, then you can sort of see that it's a complex. Uh, great Zimbabwe is not just uh, alone, it is a complex with over 200 other sites, stone cities built by Africans. When white people first saw it, some, some of them said, oh, you know, it must have been aliens. Because, of course, what they had imbibed was this notion that black people were inferior. And not only inferior, but incapable of construction. And in particular, the construction by stone. Oh, no, they don't build nothing. <laughs> you know, or build anything. So, so these are the, these are the, this is the problem. I know my time is just about out, but I have so much more to say to you uh, because uh, we, we have to know about Songhai and we have to know about the great Sonny Ali Bear, the great African king who, uh, who adopted and ascent Islam only as a practical matter, but certainly was a deep believer in the traditions of African people. I mean, it's the death of Sonny Alibert, if you ask me, that caused the Europeans, particularly the Portuguese, to find basically an open door through the Atlantic Ocean into West Africa, uh, where earlier the Mali uh, Empire uh, had given us uh, the great cities of Jenei and Timbuktu, and uh, later Gao uh, developed under the Songhai as one of the great centers. And I'm fortunate to be a member of uh, the Amaru Hasimi Maigas uh, court as a wannadu uh, of Gao, uh, a counselor of Gao. 
Uh, it is a civilization uh, that uh, we uh, have found spread throughout West Africa. The language is now being studied and people are saying, wow, well, we have lost so much, but we have gained so much by not understanding and appreciating the great depth of our civilization. Uh, I, I, I want to say to you, I appreciate you for listening to me uh, today, and I, I appreciate the fact that uh, this uh, lecture, uh, which has come to you uh, from the department as well as coming to you uh, on the uh, 23rd of August, is a lecture that uh, I've wanted to give, and, and I have so much more to say, and I will say it. And I'll say to you in the language of the ancient Kemetic people, Hotel. <laughs>